you guys are all wondering what is going on with the team in Kenya. And so we have a little video uh, from them for you. Good morning, Class Point family. Um, coming to you from Kenya. Good morning, Class Point family. Um, coming to you from Kenya. Um, the group right now, we are taking a little time um, to just kind of look at God's creation and kind of give Heather and Brian a little bit of a break <laughs> from us. Um, but we're all going to talk about a little bit about what we've done so far. Um, we arrived on Wednesday and we're very tired. Some of us only got two or three hours of sleep on the plane, uh, but we got to tour the farm and see the different aspects of the ministry. Um, Jennifer and I have toured the three preschools that are part of Kajani Farm. One is on their property and two are in other areas. Um, and on Friday, we had a field day with the kids. All of them came. Um, some of them walked. Some of them came in the back of a wagon. And what was pulling it was a motorcycle. And so the little ones came that way. Uh, but we had a field day. We did coloring. We read books. We played games. Um, so those were kind of the aspects of things we've done on Monday. Um, I'll be meeting, Jennifer and I and Heather will be meeting with the preschool teachers and just kind of talking about what, um, you know, what kind of things they need or what kind of encouragement we can give them. Uh, we also will be doing a women's Bible study with Heather. And so those are some of the things that Jennifer and I will be doing. So. Okay. Hello, Jennifer. Good morning, Cross Point. Okay. Okay, you're here now is Pastor Key. Hello, good morning, Cross Boy. I miss you. Mm. Oh, thank you for your praying. Mm. Uh, we are good by the grace of God. Uh, God bless you all. Thank you. So we uh are we I, I went out and I looked at their beehives. Uh, as it turns out, uh in, in 2018 when they were here and they made some beehives, they just made empty boxes, no frames or anything. So they weren't able to take the, take the honey out and extract the honey. So I took a, so, so we've taken a bunch of beekeeping equipment to, uh, to the farm when we, uh, when we went there. And so we are in the process of making some boxes and we've been having some rather in-depth discussion with some of the local beekeepers and then kind of getting Brian up to speed on keeping bees. And uh, so Monday, we're going to rip into their boxes. You've all heard about how terrible African bees are. And uh, I guess we're going to find out for ourselves. Uh, <laughs> the experiment continues. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Wayne. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Cross Point. <laughs> Uh, you might wonder what it is that Pastor Dave and Key and I have been doing. And what we have been doing is working with some local pastors and doing some training with them. We had just a brilliant time with them Thursday afternoon and then again Friday afternoon. We started off Thursday afternoon just asking them what are some of the challenges they are facing. And that was really informative. Uh, it kind of... Um, set us back in terms of our schedule, but it was it was just a, a brilliant way to start. And that's that's what we did. And then uh, Friday, uh, we capped it off by uh, just talking about <laughs> preaching and kind of did a seminar for them in preaching. And they really, really appreciated it. And in fact, what the one of the coolest things was, they saw our help and our participation as something that was offered to them through Kijani Farms. And that's exactly what we wanted. Mm. We wanted the, the kind of the, the connection between that service and that help to go back to what Kajani Farms is doing to impact the greater community. So thank you so much for all that you have done in helping us to get here and praying for us and supporting us in so many ways. We love you. Look forward to seeing you soon. Good morning, Crosspoint family. Thank you. 
It is fun to hear what they're doing and see how they're doing. If you're wondering where Dave was, he was videoing, so um, he, he was there. You just couldn't see him. Um, anyway, that is all for your announcements. I do, however, want to remind you that we do have prayer after the service every Sunday um, right over here. So if you have prayer needs to de today, please make sure that you come up and receive prayer. All right, here is your tidbit of information for this morning. So have you ever been at a loss um, or, you know, wondering what to pray about, how to pray for somebody, or how to pray for a certain situation? Well, this morning I want to encourage you that even if you don't know what to pray, you have two people willingly interceding for you all the time. In Romans 8.34, we learn that Jesus is at the right hand of God, and he intercedes for us. In Hebrews 7.25, we learn that Jesus always lives to intercede for us. The Holy Spirit also intercedes for us, and Romans 8, verses 26 through 27 assure us that when we don't know what to pray for, the Holy Spirit intercedes for us. So this morning, maybe you're at a loss as to how to pray for a certain situation or a person in your life, but I encourage you, come to God anyway, because you have both the, the Holy Spirit and Jesus willing to help you. Let's pray. Jesus, I am so thankful that you know what we need even before we do, and that when we are at a loss and we don't know what to say or have words to say, you do, and you intercede for us. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you do as well. Lord, I pray that this morning you would help us to have open hearts towards you, that you would help us to have open ears to hear what you have to say. Lord, we want to be people that glorify you, that honor you, that love you with all of our hearts. We invite you to be here with us this morning. We pray that you would be over this whole entire service and that it would glorify you and you alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Good morning, Cross Point. So thankful to see all of you here, sitting here. So thankful for all those watching online. My name is Michael Allen. If we have not had a chance to meet yet, I am the new associate pastor here. Dave Spooner would normally be introducing a guest speaker, but he is off in Kenya, as we saw. Well, we kind of saw. We heard him in the video anyways. And so I want to take a moment to introduce our speaker today. I'm very excited. Uh, it's the first time I get to hear him speak in person. I've heard him speak when he's preached previously. Um, and so I forgot to mention before I get into this, and Gretchen's going to throw something at me, Children's Church, you are dismissed. I promised her I wouldn't forget, and I still forgot. Man. <laughs> um, so Lee Eklov is going to be bringing the word to us today, and I'm very excited. He, if you have not heard him before, you are in for a treat. He is a pastor of 40 plus years. He's since retired and potentially busier than ever. Um, he writes a weekly column uh, to pastors. He befriends and encourages and disciples pastors. It's one of his favorite things to do. The first time he and I met was at a coffee shop, and he just randomly walked up to me because I had a stack of books on my table, and he's like, I can't not talk to you because you have books on your table. I have to, I have to figure out what you are. So Lee Eklov is going to bring us the word from Revelation today. So why don't you come up here, Lee? I'm going to pray over you really fast, and we'll get into your message. Pastor Michael. Oh, yeah. That's a weird thing to hear. I know it is. That's great. <laughs> All right. Let's pray for you real fast. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. This is the day that you have made, um, and we would just ask that you would speak to us through Lee, that Lee would get out of the way and allow you to speak to these people from your word to us. And I pray for boldness. I pray for soft hearts, and I just pray that you are glorified. And it's in Jesus' most holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Pastor Michael, I remember very well when that title was laid upon me. I had, Susan and I had been attending a church in Deerfield for five years, and then I became an associate pastor. So all of a sudden they started calling me Pastor Lee. And uh, it seemed so strange, uh, a little uncomfortable, as it should be. So. We're really glad you're here. 
I want to say uh, hello to those who are watching. I think some of my friends from other places and churches and so forth are probably tuning in, and that's kind of a cool thing. I wish we could be together. I know uh, many of you really like to have the printed sermon and have stopped at the counter this morning only to be disappointed. <clears throat> I'm sort of the opposite of Dave. He likes you to see where he's going. I don't want you to see where I'm going. <laughs> but, you know, because I might not get there. But, uh, but this full sermon in print will be available tomorrow on the church website under sermons. So uh, you can have it and read it. And uh, since I'm a writer, I hope it's worth your time to read it as well as to hear it. By the way, I hope this isn't sound. Whoa. I just start talking about how things sound and the mic falls away. I hope this doesn't sound uh, immodest or something, but I'm a writer, and if you'd like to read some of the things I've written, uh, you can do that. And I have a website, and it's about as simple as it can be. It's my name, leeecklove.com. Nobody in the world has my name, so far as I can find, so feel free to check it out. All right, I brought something today. I don't know if any of you have ever seen one of these things. Have you ever seen one of these things? Some of you maybe went to church where you would see these. I didn't. Mine was a gift. When I uh, left one of our churches, our best prayer gave me this thing. And uh, that's what it would be used like. I don't even know how to do it, but it would be filled with incense, and then the, it would hang. I'm a little unsure whether to let it hang. Yeah. And then you go like this, and the moving spreads the smoke of the incense. Now here's the question. Why in the world would a church have incense? We don't have it. What, what is it? Well, it smells great. The, we tried it in our church in Pennsylvania once, this very thing. But we didn't know how much to use. <coughs> and we just went to Kmart and got some, some incense Sandalwood, I think. And we were coming, this lady that gave me this came down the aisle. We were talking about prayer, and she's doing this. And it was pretty cool because it's so sensory. The problem was that we didn't know how to turn it off. <laughs> and pretty soon, folks down in the front are going, because <coughs> <coughs> it was getting too, too strong. Well, anyway, that's significant to our day. There are censers in the Bible. They don't look like this, typically. They wear uh, sometimes a bowl. But we're going to talk about it. I bring this today because I want to challenge us to think about what actually happens when we pray. Like, how does that transaction work? It's, you know, when you think about... Um, if you buy something online and you just have a credit card and somewhere out there your money goes and it gets paid and how does that work, right? Well, prayer, how does it work? Where does it go? How does this transaction happen? Right? That's what we want to talk about today. And there's a place in the Bible that tells us. Now, one more thing. Uh... If you, some of you, a very few of you, like poetry. And uh, one of the great English poets from the 1600s was named George Herbert. He called himself a country parson. And this guy in his little church wrote amazing poems. Maybe his most famous is a poem called Prayer Number One. And it's just a list of metaphors that he thought of from Scripture for prayer. Like, um, he says in this poem, prayer is the church's banquet. Isn't that good? Think about that. It's our banquet. 
He says in another line, it is the soul in paraphrase. What my soul wants to say, it comes out in prayer. Or um, the heart in pilgrimage. When we pray, we're going somewhere. We're changing. We're moving toward God. When we, isn't that great? But he uses one that I want to talk about today. It's the title of this sermon. Reversed Thunder. Reversed Thunder. You might not know, I don't think I would have, why he uses that as a picture for prayer. And that's what we're going to see today. It's from Revelation chapter five or chapter eight, verses one to five. And uh, I love it if you have a Bible uh, that you see it there before you, Revelation eight one to five, because it gives us a unique and vivid picture. It's nothing. There's nothing like this anywhere in the Bible. It's a picture of prayer. Now. Before we get to Revelation 8, I just want to set the stage for what's happened a little bit of what's happened in Revelation up to this point. Uh, in the preceding chapters, John has described a scroll with seven seals. <clears throat> and then he talks about how these seals are each opened by Christ. The first four seals release the terrifying Four horsemen of the apocalypse. They come thundering out of heaven to earth to wreak judgment. The fifth seal reveals the constant cries of the martyrs under the throne. They call down a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? The sixth seal unleashes not only an earthquake, but a heavenquake, shakes everything, shaking loose the very stars of heaven so that people cried out for the mountains to fall on them. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can withstand it? And then we come to chapter 7, which is this glorious scene of all the saints and angels gathered before God's throne, and they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Man, there has been so much sound. Everybody's shouting and crying out, and there's all this noise. Then we come to Revelation 8 verse 1. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. That's a strange little verse. I picture John in his cave on Patmos, the island. And only Jesus is present. And he's hearing this story. And, or seeing it, I think. And I assume that this half hour is sort of his time. It's just quiet. Half an hour after all of this. Angels stand ready. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God and seven trumpets were given to them. In the Old Testament, trumpets worked in two ways. On the one hand, they were sort of harbingers, warnings of God's judgment. But they were also sounded to begin the year of Jubilee, a whole year of celebrating provision and presence of God. And they start it with trumpets. Both of those, judgment and the year of Jubilee, fit this situation. Trumpets are just the thing we need. Here are the seven angelic trumpeters. Stand at the ready, but silent. Waiting. 
Why? Why? What are they waiting for? Then it says in verse 3, another angel who had a golden censer, there it is, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all God's people. As I'll show you in a few minutes, uh, in another place in Revelation, it says incense, which are the prayers of God's people. On the golden altar, in front of the throne. Why the waiting? Why the silence? Apparently, so that the accumulated prayers of God's people can be brought to God. This picture, evidently from the end of time, makes clear something we might forget or find hard to, de- hard to believe. It is this. Our prayers get heaven's undivided attention. Our prayers get heaven's undivided attention. I think the silence here is to tell us of the rapt attention God gives to our prayers. Now, it's difficult to create a timeline for the book of Revelation, despite all the efforts. But it does seem that this little interlude is like a pivot for this book. Kind of everything sort of hangs on it, balances on this little picture. It doesn't really do anything except capture this image of prayer. It appears that this happens after, that everything that happens in this book afterwards, for sure, happened in response to prayer. Why would he tell us this if that's not the case? These are answers to prayer. The rest of Revelation, all this mind-blowing stuff is from prayer. Verse 3 here speaks of the prayers of all the saints. All the saints. So, our prayers are here also. A few of us prayed over in the prayer room before the service for, I don't know, 30, 45 minutes. Our prayers are there. The prayers you pray, the prayer, they're all there. Isn't that amazing? Our prayers are among those that silence heaven. Two quotes for you that are really great. One is by R.H. Charles. He said, The needs of the saints are more to God, they mean more, they're more, he gives more attention, than all the psalmody of heaven. In other words, he'll let songs go quiet so that he can hear your prayers. And I like this by William Barclay. He said, Even the music of heaven and even the thunder of revelation are stilled so that God's ear may catch the whispered prayer of the humblest of his trusting people. Oh, man, that's cool. Right there, that's just enough. But there's way more. Let's go back again to verse 3 and 4. So I've read this before. Let me just read it again. Another angel who had a golden censer came and stood at the altar. We've got two altars here. Comes and stands at the altar. He was at that altar, given much incense to offer with the prayers of all God's people on the golden uh, altar in front of the throne. He gets incense from this one, and he offers it on that one. The smoke of the incense, together with the prayers of God's people, went up before God from the angel's hand. So let's summarize that this way. Our prayers 
ignited from the altar of Christ's sacrifice, become the incense of heaven. Our prayers, ignited from the altar of Christ's sacrifice, become the incense of heaven. As I've told you, the biblical symbol throughout Scripture for prayer is incense. I've never been in a church that used incense, but it's not a bad idea. If you make the connections, don't choke on it. (laughs) In the holy place, the tabernacle, here's a picture of the interior of the tabernacle. Many of you have seen this before. I call this outer section, you can kind of see where the holy of holies is separated from the holy place. I like to think of that center section there as sort of the living room of God. It's where he, even though the Israelites couldn't go in, only the priests could, it sort of symbolizes our relationship with him with three um, pieces of furniture. One is the lampstand, that candelabra. And the light of that lampstand symbolizes God's truth. The light of his truth. And it's always there. Across from it is this little table that had uh, 12 loaves of bread, always changed, always fresh. And bread is a symbol of a meal, right? Of fellowship. Let's break bread together. Uh, come over to Meg's with me and have, a, have, a, have a, a, a muffin and some coffee. Bread is a symbol of fellowship. And then the altar of incense, which was the thing closest to the presence of God. God's presence was in that interior holy of holies where the, uh, where the t- um, uh, ark, sorry. I'm an old man. Things happen. That's where the ark is. That curtain would be all the way across. But the, ho- the closest thing was that little altar of incense. Now, this incense was a big deal. I was thinking about this. So this I, as I preached this in the past, I never really made note of it, but I want you to see it. In Exodus 30, God gave Israel a very specific recipe for this incense. And he says to them, you can't make this for anything else. Don't sell it at the market. Don't make it at home. This is only to be used here on penalty of death. This is it. The Lord said to Moses, take fragrant spices, gum resin, anyaka, I looked that one up, and galbanum, and pure frankincense, all in equal amounts, and make a fragrant blend of incense, the work of a perfumer. It's to be salted and pure and sacred. Grind some of it into powder and place it in front of the Ark of the Covenant, uh, of the covenant uh, law in the tent of meeting where I will meet with you. It shall be most holy to you. Do not make any incense with this formula for yourselves. Consider it holy to the Lord. All of that. Why? Because prayer is so precious to God. It's the thing that is right in front of him. Right close to him. The thing that silences everything else for God. Morning and evening, incense was burned in that uh, holy place by the priest. And it was also added sometimes to other sacrifices. The symbol being prayer brings all these things to God. Now we learn here in this passage that what Israel was taught to do so long before in the wilderness was a kind of reenactment of what was always happening in heaven. That's why he gave them the tabernacle. This is sort of the architecture of worship or the architecture of prayer. This is what happens when we pray, where we go, what it looks like. And incense was definitely part of it. Revelation chapter 5, verse 8 goes to the throne of God, and it says, the four 
living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. And what were they holding? Each one had a harp and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. Do you ever think about your prayers that way? Hmm. Now, the thing about incense <clears throat> is that it doesn't do anything unless it's burned. My friend that gave me this uh, sensor gave me some incense. I forgot about it until I pulled it out this morning. Uh, you can't see it. If I would have been smart, I would have had a picture for you, but... Nothing. There's no aroma at all. With this, she gave me this little kind of a, a smoke thing that you light and put in there, and once it's glowing, then you sprinkle this on it, and all of a sudden, there's this fragrance. Prayer isn't good unless it's ignited. Incense isn't good. It doesn't do anything no matter how what good the recipe, unless it's ignited. So where does the fire come from in this story? In the Old Testament tabernacle, there were two altars. Uh, one is outside in the courtyard, and the other is the one I showed you. The courtyard is where sacrifices were offered. Animal sacrifices, uh, um, uh, grain sacrifices, things like that. But in particular, when an animal was sacrificed for the sins of people, the fire of that, the censer was brought to that fire and the incense was ignited and then it was carried back into the holy place and set on that little golden altar right before God. Do you see the importance of this? Do you see what the symbol is saying? Because this is what's going on in heaven. And what's burning on that altar of sacrifice in heaven? It's not a lamb. It's the blood of Christ. Jesus is the sacrifice. So the fi and the fire in the, in the sacrificial system is the signal of God's acceptance. That it's rising to God. Without Our prayers find their fragrance when ignited by the fire from the sacrifice of Christ. That's what's going on in heaven that you can't see, that we don't think about. But that's how it works. Without that fire from the sacrifice of Christ, our prayers are only warm wishes. I'll pray for you. Keep me in your prayers. The whole nation's praying for you. They're just warm wishes. Or just positive thinking. The, the faintly scented potpourri of positivity. That's all it is. Almost everybody prays everywhere. And frankly, I don't doubt that God hears them all. God hears everything. And amazingly, God answers some of those prayers as they are. But it is the prayers of God's people, those whom Jesus has redeemed from their sins, uh, that make, uh, whose prayers are holy incense, made from a special recipe, you might say, of faith and forgiveness and fervency. Faith and forgiveness and fervency are this, the spices, you might say, brought to the heavenly altar where they are ignited by the flame from the sacrifice of Christ. And our prayers, once ignited, fill heaven with a holy fragrance. This is amazing, isn't it? The point of incense, of course, is the fragrance. It has no other job. It's not good for anything else but to be burned and to give this 
extraordinary fragrance. In this case, it is God who delights in that fragrance. That's why we're not supposed to do it at home or anyplace else. It's God who delights in this fragrance. Revelation tells us about the stupendous sights and sounds of heaven, things which we cannot even imagine. But the fragrance of heaven is our prayers. Our prayers. Have you heard our prayers? I mean, really. I've been a few times in places where I kind of heard a prayer that kind of pushed me back in my seat, but most of the time not. For my sake, just to say it as well as it's, it's not that great. I've sat in a lot of prayer meetings. Well, they just seem so ordinary. So unimpressive. But when our prayers are biblically shaped and we're given the shape in the Lord's Prayer, honoring God's holy name, praying for his kingdom to come and his will sin, no matter how halting or plain or fragile they may be, God breathes in their aroma with a smile of delight. Prayer is the fragrance of heaven. Many years ago, I preached on this uh, back on the radio one time in Pittsburgh, where we lived in that area. And I got a letter a few days later from a lady named Isabel Fisher. She wrote this. I had it in my heart that the only man-made thing in heaven was the scars in Christ's hands and feet and side. But this passage has made me know that our... Wait till you see what's coming. Verse 5. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, first altar, and hurled it on the earth. And there came peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. <laughs> Whoa. Yes. Took that thing in his hands like this, strode out into the street, right in the middle of the street, and hurled this thing like a pitcher into the, the prayers of the saints. A fire from Christ's sacrifice invade earth with God's judgment and salvation. They invade earth with God's judgment and salvation. When the incense of our prayer is hurled earthward, it becomes incendiary. But when it's hurled to the earth, it becomes a bombshell. Now, that description I just read of what it's like when the uh, fire hits the earth, that might sound familiar to you because it's used elsewhere in the Bible. The first time it's used is in the story in Exodus, in the story when Israel don't touch the mark yourselves pure and stand back. And it says, on the morning of the third day there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blow. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently. That's what happens. Red. It's like this. This just heals a couple months ago, and then uh, was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Now listen, the room doesn't have to shake for God to invade. This picture is given to us so we know what's going on, whether or not you feel your feet shaking. Prayers rarely seem powerful when we pray them. In fact, they seem halting sometimes. 
stumbling, poorly put. We, it's like trying to lift a piano sometimes. We have so little muscle to lift a big prayer, but that's what they are. Before they are, they got to get to those altars. Things are unimproved with praying. It's never come easy to me. It's the thing I always like after I've done it. So if you see a prayer meeting coming up, and you go, oh, man, I don't know about that. I, I got, I, I, that's not really for me. It's not for me either. There's not, it's not, it's more fun. It's more energizing to sing songs together or stand in the foyer and talk about Jesus. Prayer is kind of flat when we're doing it. Most of the time. So never be put off. Lift up Jesus' name. Pray for our church. It's here and in this city. It ain't too big. Prayer isn't the last resort of the hopeless. It is the fl- fragrant and flaming, confident, confidence of the faithful. It is the fragrant and flaming confidence of the faithful. We had a couple in our church in uh, Lincolnshire for a while, and um, he was from Columbia. And his parents, uh, were, was a pa- they were pastors and missionaries there, Jairo and Blanca Roberts. Here's a picture of them with their little grandkid. In 1975, a communist guerrilla group named M19 the church for money and supplies, many times holding hostage the missionaries and the churchgoers, sometimes during an actual church service. This is what uh, their daughter-in-law has sent to me. They often threatened to burn down the church and the homes of the Christians in the community. One time the guerrillas locked everyone in the middle of a service into the church and told them that they were going to set the church on fire. They were never able to start the fire. And they eventually left. Every time the church was held up or threatened, the church would gather together and pray. God would always answer their prayers by binding the guerrillas from destroying the church and village. Jairo and Blanca described it as God literally stopping the flames from being able to spread and from guns jamming and not being able to fire, and so on. Not one missionary or congregant was ever harmed. Now, I know it's not always like that. There are martyrs under the altar praying, How long, O Lord? Martyrs. Holy presence reversed thunder. And now you know the rest of the story. We need patience sometimes to wait for God as he collects prayers, waits for his divine time. But the prayers of the saints, raised in faith in Jesus' name and for his glory, are transformed from incense to high explosives, hurled back to earth with pinpoint accuracy by the angel at God's right hand. And wherever our prayers collide with sin, wherever our prayers crash into terrible darkness, wherever our prayers target the enemy of our souls, whenever we plead for God to go before us, to guard us as we go forward, God Almighty himself invades with all his rumbling, flashing, rolling holiness riding on the flaming missiles of our prayers. And things can no more stay the same than if lightning struck or an earthquake shrugged its mighty shoulders. So now I'm going to lead you in prayer. Uh, You know, don't get your hopes up that this is going to be a prayer that you're going to remember. That's the point. I'm just going to lead you in prayer. 
I'm going to take my cues from the Lord's Prayer. And the hard part, I know, as a listener, is you need to pray with me. Kind of amen along with me. Because it's our collective prayer that brings us a special fragrance and power. Listen, I thought about writing this prayer because I like to write prayers. I like words. The Bible also says, pray in the Spirit in all times and all occasions, which I take it to mean that let the Spirit sometimes tell you in that moment what to pray. So that's what I'm going to do. Shall we pray? <clears throat> Our Father in heaven, Thank you for being our Father. We would be grateful just to be able to see you afar on your throne, high and lifted up, the God Almighty, but you are our Father. And when we came to Jesus, you saw us a long way off and ran and met us, threw your arms around us, because you had compassion on us. May your name be holy. Lord, every single day if we circulate in this world or watch television, we hear your name made unholy. When your name is cheapened, people don't know who you are. But you are holy. You're set apart. You're high and lifted up. To see you would buckle our knees, render us speechless, wishing that we could die. But you are our Father. You tell us to come boldly to your throne. So we do. We pray, O oh God, that your kingdom would come. Right now in our hearts, our hearts are little kingdoms of their own paltry and prone to wander. We each know our hearts. I pray that you would reign in my heart and the hearts of these brothers and sisters, that you would take charge of things we've held back or not seen. Your kingdom come, Lord, in our church so that we shed those things that we want, that we want in a church that aren't very important that we desire the things that make us distinctive as the people of God. <clears throat> I pray your kingdom would come in this city. Lord, more people were killed here, violence, the last couple days. I pray for our city. I pray for our mayor, for the councils. I pray for those who work with the poor, Lord, this city is a hotbed of human trafficking. May your kingdom come. May you reign here. Stifle them. Punish the evildoers. Set free those who are victims. Your kingdom come. Your kingdom come, Lord, in our country. Such a mess. We can't find a single champion, a single candidate anywhere who we think would really be able to turn us around. We need Jesus. Your kingdom come. In this world, Ukraine, oh God, your kingdom come. Pray for those believers there. God, strengthen them. Father, we pray your kingdom would come on earth, that this would all be over. Jesus would come back. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Your will be done here. In me and in this church, for our friends in Kenya right now, for those who work in this city in all kinds of ways, and other churches, Lord, we're not in competition. We're in league, and I pray your will would be done. I pray that you provide for the people here in our church who have special needs, of finance or health. Give us this day our daily bread. And lead us not into temptation, Father. 
Sometimes I think you lead us there so that we would learn how frail and foolish and uh, sin-oriented we are. May it not be necessary. Help us to be holy people. Deliver us from the evil one. So these things we lift to you. Lord, these are small words, but they rise to you, and we believe they become ignited, fragrant in your presence, and that they will be hurled back to earth, bringing your presence here in your good time. All of this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.